Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Beit Midrash. I uh, hope everybody had a good week. Hope everybody's learning went well. Um, hope everybody's feeling good, and uh, welcome back. Um, Barbara seemed eager before I started recording to uh, jump in about what she didn't like. So uh, let's not waste time with realities. Let's dive right into Parshat Sav. Uh, thoughts, comments. Twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty. Now I can talk. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rabbi. We're on the wrong foot today. I appreciated this one. He started out second or third paragraph telling me why he got to his life-changing idea, and I liked it. So, okay, so that was a good class. Glad we, we all came. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just joking. Um, Anybody else have comments or reactions before we dive in a little deeper? I, I don't know if you're ready to go there yet, but I I, I was kind of didn't like the way he used the nun study or picked out his opinion of what the nun studies show. I, I don't because know if y'all read if y'all read the nun study. But I have not read the nun study beyond this. No. Okay, well, I, I read, I read a uh, this guy gave a, the guy that wrote it that did the study gave several years later gave a talk about it, and it, it, it was nothing theological about it. I mean, it wasn't a, a Thanksgiving thing or a praise thing. It, it's talking about why these nuns live so long. First thing. A fair number of the nuns, even though they did live a long time and live longer, did not have such good endings. Uh, and 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 senility was a big part of it. Um, he he says that uh, it's a it the, the group. It's not one advantage they have is they don't smoke and they don't drink, and. So their lifestyle tends to give them an advantage as far as longevity, forgetting the religious aspect of it. And I thought, I thought that from a medical standpoint, I thought that the most interesting thing about it was that the the one thing that they were able to correlate that really seemed to have an impact was they looked at the at the writing of the nuns when they came into the program, 20-ish year old women that that entered this these places. And they actually they they scored their not their writing ability, but the complexity of their writing and the depth of their writing. And this what just simple sentences, I was born here, I went to school here, I always wanted to be a nun, as to some of them wrote very complex introductions. And the, the it was they followed them at like 20 year, 50 year intervals. And the ones that wrote the most complex introductions of themselves when they entered the program had the most longevity and the best longevity, they they had less senility. They had in all the factors they looked at, they came out ahead. The ones that were strictly gave the facts as they saw them when they came in and wrote simple sentences had the poorest outcomes, uh, which I, I thought that was, I, whatever that shows, I don't know if there's any cause and effect or how you, what you do with that, the relation does not mean causation. Right, right. But it was it was interesting, and I, I, I just thought that that the rabbi tried to how does that correlate? Simpl thank simplify things a little too thanks, much. It was being thankful. It's gratitude. Anyway, that's there's a, there's a part of me that feels like uh, he's doing what he does with 
the parsha, which is Barbara's big complaint most of the time, right? Like he he cherry picks one part of a much larger section to prove a point, which is you know kind of a rabbinic way of reading these things, not a scientific way. But... <laughs> right, right. No, it was interesting. I mean, it's interesting if you if you're interested. I mean, you you can Google it and find these things. It's a interesting to read that study. I mean, that's. So here's my, I guess, here's my question in response. Is, is your disagreement of how he reads that study affect your, your uh, appreciation for his conclusion? No, no, okay. no. I was just curious. But Howard's right. A lot of studies are criticized scientifically on the basis of trying to make a connection between cause and well, coincidence. And so even when he moves away from the nun study and he talks about, oh, exercise and things like that. I mean, these are things that people do that just happen to appear in people that um, also have uh, a longevity or good health outcomes. So uh, the words correlation, causation, et cetera, coincidence. Are all applicable here, but I do agree with Howard. It doesn't affect whether I appreciate the connection that he made at this time. So even though he used two words out of the whole parsha, he got somewhere that made sense, and he told us right away. Right? Yeah, I have um, not read the Nud study. Um, the but I have heard it cited before in exactly in, in exactly in the way that Howard talked about it in in, to, in the um uh, in having to do with the complexity of the thinking of the people um who survived the longer longer as opposed to the people who survived a shorter amount of time. But the thing that um you know the thing that just impressed me about Rabbi Sachs and a lot of rabbis is, I mean, there's all this stuff about all this sacrifice and what you do with the blood and what you do with the, you know, how to make the cakes and and it just goes on and on and on forever, and you know. And every year I ask myself, am I going to read this because it is so boring? <laughs> and then there's some rabbi that comes along and is able to pull from it something that is really meaningful. Um, and so I thought that um, that uh, Sachs's discussion of gratitude, whether, you know, it was sort of pulled out of this, you know, one little sentence in this whole long thing um, was was a, a, an interesting and and really important um, important discussion. Mm -hmm. Here's a question for the rabbi: Could you talk about the way this applies to us today at Bethel? Um, let's say just the whole Thanksgiving off. I mean, no, in what know, sense? Uh, in what sense? Well, how does it alter our services? Uh, we're coming up on Pesach in a little bit. Do we omit various parts because those loaves aren't? Uh, I mean, I think the Orthodox change their uh, maybe part of the Amida or something where there's a Thanksgiving part of it. Maybe also in um, Suke de Zimra. I can't remember the names of the, the prayers. Uh, when I was a kid, I mean, like 25 years ago, I took a class at an Orthodox shul where we went word for word through the Shemini Esrei. And, and it was mentioned there that Ashkenazi, for example, uh, Margaret didn't read the recipe and she didn't bring us one of those loaves of fine flour and oil today. But, Margaret, we need 40 of them, and we're going to eat 36 of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you learned that I don't bake? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, 
Um, Unfortunately, I'm plumb out of frankincense at home, so. <laughs> yeah, we can't do that. <laughs> well, maybe these don't have the frankincense in them because isn't this portion the first time we hear about this particular sacrifice? So that last week we had a sacrifice with the frankincense. Uh, well, there's frankincense in this one as well. The meal, oh, there is? Yeah. Well, how do you know the recipe and I don't? I cook a lot more than you do. <laughs> <laughs> because I read the Parsha more recently than you did. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. I. <laughs> What um, do we make changes in our service? Because I, I remember the discussion was Ashkenazi make changes, not all Spartan do, make Spartan don't. So because those lobes of fine flour, they're not matzah, they're, or maybe they're not made in 18 minutes or whatever. For some reason, they're hummets and therefore, you know, you know, use them, you know, talk about them. Yeah, I think I lost the thread of your question in there. Um, do we alter our, our um, do we alter our service? Um, a blessing late in the Amida. I mean, I'd have to go back. Look, I'm so, gonna... I mean, so here's kind of how it works is additionally, what you do um, is you recite the full Amida privately, and then you go back and the shots, the Shaliyah Tzibor, the prayer leader, goes back and repeats the entire repetition. Why do you do that, by the way? What's the reason for doing a full repetition? Anybody know? It's because in a time in an yeah, in an older time when literacy rates were much lower, you might think that people might not have been able to recite the Amida privately because they wouldn't have known how to read it. So the Shaliyah Hatzibor would recite the entire thing so everybody could hear it and discharge their obligation by saying Amen, so that everybody could have the opportunity for the mitzvah of say, doing the Amidah by saying Amen, even if they weren't able to personally recite it. They didn't have books either. That's right. Uh, had some books, but yes, not as prevalently as we did. So, you know, in our society, we A, have books, B, have much higher literacy rates, and C, um, you don't recite the Amidah in Hebrew. There are certain prayers that do need to be recited in Hebrew and are um, in rabbinic phrasing. You do not fulfill your obligation if you do not. The Amidah is not one. Um, there's like, you can probably, I think you can count on one hand all of them. Birkat Kohanim, the, the, uh, the priestly blessing that the priests do has to be done in Hebrew, but that's like one of the very few. Um, so, you know, halakhically speaking, the reason, and this is very much the conservative movement's argument, historically speaking, the reasons for doing a full repetition no longer apply, so there's no reason to do a full repetition, um, which is why we customarily will do it through the Kedusha, because you don't do the Kedusha privately, you only you don't do like the full Kedusha, like Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. You don't do that privately uh, when you recite it privately. So you go through that so everybody can say that together. And then you do the rest of the Amidah privately. It's at least how we we do it at Bethel. There are conservative congregations that still do a full repetition. Um, yeah, we just ain't one of them. Uh, but when you do a full repetition, that's where you get his comment on page 136 that there's two modim prayers, that oh. there's one that you say privately and that the leader says during the repetition. But when the leader says it during the repetition, there's a separate one that the congregation recites kind of under their breath while he's doing it. So traditionally, you know, the leader will go, modim anafnu la, 
And we'll kind of do it quietly so that everybody else can do theirs quietly. And then we'll pick up with the last couple words and continue on with the blessing together. Um, does that answer your question? Well, I appreciate that. I think it does help me. Um, I'd have to check some of my Sephard Sephardic cedarine that I have. Um, I think it's in those two that both of them are in there, but I'd have to double check. I don't remember for sure. Yes, Suzanne. Why did he make such a thing about the verb coming before the noun? Doesn't it usually come before the noun? That's how he starts his chapter. Yes, yeah, so that's at the beginning of this chapter. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to find Ah, yeah, It's like the very first paragraph. Um, it's mostly for, for emphasis, isn't it? When the verb comes before the noun, doesn't it? Yeah, so, uh, it, well, it, it depends. Um, um, in um, in the Torah, generally, the verb comes before the noun. In rabbinic writings, it kind of goes back and forth. It does not in modern so he is kind of pulling, it is a little bit of a thin thread there, but it's it's a nice little drosh on something that's, you know, abnormal to the average reader, because, you know, the average English. Israeli would say, Ani like, I'm grateful to you. Um, yes, in, in rabbinic writings, it, in rabbinic grammar, it can kind of go either way. It's a little vaguer, but yes, it is. It's a little drosh on something that's really just typical grammar. <laughs> but it works really well, Suzanne, for what he wants to talk about. Yes, <laughs> it, it's a nice opening. It's it's a nice uh, what um, what the rabbis call <laughs> petichta. It's like an opening midrash to get before he gets to the bigger man. Um, but yes, yeah, so you see, you see the same thing in that modim prayer. Modim anach nulach, like modim, the verb comes before the noun, and that there also. I mean, I I think he would, he would probably argue for the same, the same drash that it applies there equally to modami. But again, it's, okay. I think it's a stylistic, semantic grammar. Okay thing in rabbinic text, but it's a nice drosh. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? So, look, I uh, I will say I kind of did like this one. I do think this is a good one. And I think there's some, there is some evidence and we've talked about it before about how this works. That more you do something, the more you look at things, the more of a perspective you take in a particular way, the more likely you're going to continue on that perspective. Um, you know, I've talked to, um, the number of psychologists and therapists who say like the first thing they give for people who one of the things they say for somebody who's feeling depressed is have you tried a gratitude journey right because they're trying to get them to think in a different way as a way of changing some of those neural pathways to focus in a different ways which gets to his larger point if you look for the good you're more likely to find the good um judaism encourages us to try to find that good um, that's why we say a hundred that's why we have as he says um that we thank you god for letting me yeah, man letting me get out of bed thank you god for letting there be solid ground underneath me thank you god for letting me be able to put on my kippah thank you god for letting me put on my belt thank you for letting me get dressed like recognizing that things don't have to be that way. Um, that 
the fact they are should inspire us with some sort of gratitude towards doing it. Um, Speaking um, kind of personally, um, I have found that um, after my husband died, concentrating on gratitude for all of the really great things that we had together um, has made it a whole lot easier. Um, and I'm I'm sort of comparing that, and and maybe I shouldn't say this, but I remember after my my mother was widowed that that she was full of laments, um, and uh, and 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 she did very poorly, um, in some ways. But um, this is that's that practice. Um, has has really sustained me um, a lot. So I really... And, uh, yeah, I don't think you're alone either. And, you know, sure. I, thank God it has. But, um, you know, I think there are people who, and I've seen them, who, you know, a loved one dies and it's kind of like, my life is over. What am I supposed to do now? And those people really struggle through the grief process because they they can't move past their loss. Whereas, you know, other people were like, you know what? We had, you know, my loved one had a great life. I, I'm lucky I got to spend as much time with them as I did. And I'm grateful for the amount of time. And here, like, I have these, I have these memories and wonderful thoughts about this person. Um, those people tend to do okay. <laughs> it's not easy, as you, I'm sure you can attest to, Margaret. It's not easy. There are it times make it easier. Are, it's just but it's a bit of a struggle to go that way. But by yeah. and large, it's 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 not so hard. Yes, it's it, you know, it makes the grief a little more manageable. And maybe the you know maybe the the I mean I've not been a good Jew <laughs> in the sense of, you know, being obeying all the halakha or so on and so forth. But, um, um, you know, for the, I'd say, last 25 years, um, just the, all of the, all of the, you know, morning blessings and, you know, whatnot, not that I always do them, but it's, you know, it's 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 as as Rabbi Sack says, it's it's a teaching of a way of a of of a mode of living that that um, you know that really uh, it, it really affects. I, I mean, I really I personally feel that it's really made a, a significant uh, difference in my in my life. And as Rabbi Sack says. It doesn't come naturally. Like naturally, people look at the bad in the world, and the bad in life, and think about how awful things are. Yeah. That's kind of our natural predisposition. Um, Darwinian. So it, pardon. I said Darwinian. Yes, uh, he he does bring up you know evolutionary reasons why that might be the case. Um, but it takes work and practice. And as I say, like if you know, if it was easy to do, the rabbis wouldn't have had to tell us to do it. <laughs> yes, Susan. It may take work, but it does become a habit. It can become a, a habit. If you... Yes, it takes work. Um, we have to practice it. We have to work on it. We have to consciously think about it in doing it. Um, and it takes it takes some effort because it's not it doesn't come naturally if it came naturally we wouldn't have to work so hard. but and the rabbis wouldn't need to tell us to do it because it would just be what we naturally do um but that's part of the 
that's part of the uh, mindset generally that we're supposed to walk around with. That's why when you talk to, you know, an Orthodox Jew, you know, how are you doing? They say, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Thank God. Like, God's blessed. Whatever is going on, thank God it's going. You know what? I'm grateful. It, 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 things might be absolutely horrible. Right now, but you know what? Thank God I'm here. I'm alive. And I can thank God that I'll, I'm, I'm still chugging along. I have a friend who's modern, modern Orthodox, and he um, I, he and I traveled together for a couple of days one time, and um, he did. I mean, he did all of the all of the blessings. You know, he was washing his head. He, all the when I was part of the time I was with him. I don't know what he did else time, but you know, the, uh, he did all of these blessings, and I wondered. But I don't know him well enough to ask, and I, it's too personal to really ask anybody whether they're just um, uh, just at this point, And I guess he's he's probably sixty. Um, at this point, are they routine, um, or you know, do you really, you know, do you really feel them? Um, Yeah, so I mean that's part of this, you know. Uh, as Sheree can attest in the intro classes, like that's part of the tension that I try to bring out in Jewish prayer, is, you know, Protestant Christianity is very big on spontaneous prayer. Okay, like, uh, let me let's pray together in the like right now. Let's pray together. Whatever we're thinking, whatever we're feeling in this moment. Um, which is great. It's phenomenal. Um, but the problem for, you know, the lay person is there are moments in your life when you're like, I don't know what to say. What do I say in this moment? Like, I am hit so hard, I don't know what to do. Um, I don't have the words to express what I'm feeling. And in that sense, Judaism says, here you go. Here are some words for you to say in those moments. We we got you. Um, but the flip is also true, is that there's a part of it in which, yes, you say the same prayers over and over and over and over and over and over, three times a day, seven days a week, um, you know, 365 days a year. Um, even, you know, Yom Kippur, the, a lot of those words are still there. They're just there in a different way. Um, and you just got other stuff thrown in on top of them. Um, you're always saying them. And so at some point, at what point does it just feel like I'm just saying the same things? But the flip of that is how can you make them meaningful each day? How do you balance what you're feeling with what the prayers are saying and find, and that's really what prayer is, the balance of Jewish prayer is trying to do. It's trying to help you feel something and inspire you to feel something, but giving you the words when you don't know what else to say. And so it's a, it's, it's a tension and you read, you read enough Jewish prayer, you feel that tension about Jewish prayer, like the philosophies and stuff, you feel that tension and that it, there's, you know, what if I want to say something else? There's space, the, the, it does create, there are spaces in Jewish prayer for personal prayers and personal, um, for you to say whatever you're feeling. But um, there's kind of that tension and balance between the obligation and the, um, the spirit and what you're trying to say. And you're reminding me of there was a an interim rabbi <clears throat> um, before Rabbi Nuri, I forget his name. Um left. Hmm? Rabbi left. Rabbi left. Yeah. <clears throat> I went to one or two classes that he taught when I was in in town visiting my kids, and um, he told a story about having something 
he got some terrible news about one of his children or or a scary or maybe the news wasn't terrible, but there was like maybe, you know, she was in a car accident and maybe she was in or maybe she wasn't. I don't know. It was something sort of up in the air. He didn't know what. And he talked about being so grateful that he had some automatic, you know, he had without thinking about it automatically, he, he had in his repertoire words, you know, prayers to say um, that were appropriate. And and, uh, uh, and that was very comforting for him in the story that he told. Yeah, I think everybody wants to hear that they only have to pray when they really, really mean it. And it's just like, instantly from the heart I think that sounds nice I mean it sounds nice if you if you know that's what people want to hear but I don't think that's really realistic for the human condition to only pray when it's you know like felt and completely from the heart and all that I think in order to get there to truly get there I think you have to have a foundation of prayers that even if you don't realize it is benefiting you, even if it's the same thing every day and you don't always understand the meaning, I think you have to have that to get to a place to where you can have those honest, true prayers um, that have meaning. So. You know, on, on Cherie's thought, you know, prayer is a prayer is a skill in some sense. It, the more you do it, the more it comes naturally to do. Um, so, like, if you never pray, and then something comes up where you're like, "I really need to," like, I, 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 I feel like I need to express something, but you haven't done it. You don't know what how to express it. Um, whereas prayer can kind of give you the words to do it. Um, Elsewhere, Rabbi Sachs has this uh, really kind of beautiful um, vision of prayer in that it's a combination of two different things. Um, on one hand, it's the combination of, it's based on the sacrificial ritual in the temple. Um, the timing in which we do the prayers is largely based on when sacrifices were offered in the temple. Um, in which it's it's ritualized, it's scripted, it's performative. You you know what you're doing when you're doing it. But he also talks about how the timing is also linked with the patriarchs, where you know we do shakari because Abraham woke up in the morning to stand before God, and what was he doing? He was obviously praying. Um, and you know Isaac is walking along in the fields meditating. What is he meditating? He's obviously praying in the afternoon, and that's where we get men. And, you know, Jacob was at, was afraid at night. So what did Jacob do? He prayed. And that's where we get Mark. But the text doesn't, but the Torah doesn't tell us what they prayed. The Torah doesn't tell us, here's, and here's what Abraham said while he was standing. Um, here's what Isaac was praying in the field. It's, they were praying from their heart. And so that's the other half of prayer is that there's a ritualized scripted function, but it's supposed that ritualized scripted function is supposed to come from the heart and supposed to merge the sacrificial and the prophetic in a sense, the patriarchs and the temple together. And that's what we strive to do in prayer. How do yes. you teach someone to pray from their heart? Is there, I mean, it sounds like this is not formulaic. It's not what? It's not a formula. You don't say, you know, start with this and cover that and then tell God what you told him. And, you, know, that kind of, you know, it's not like writing a lecture. It's, how, I'm sure that there's... Uh, I have never taken one, but I know there are classes on how to pray, which some of them, when I've attended, have been the choreography of prayer, not the actual, this part that we're talking about today, the 
getting a prayer from the heart out of person. How do you teach someone to do that? So I think there's there's kind of two ways I think about it. Is in understanding what the prayers say and what the prayers mean and in understanding the structure of the service and why it's structured the way it is, because um, just as if you understand how Shakespeare structures his plays, it helps you understand the play better. So too, the service is structured in a specific way and there's a meaning to the way it's structured. And understanding that can help make prayer more meaningful to you in doing so. And so when you, and trying, you know, once you understand all that, you can be like, you know, I really need, I really need to feel loved today. Ahavada then much handy comes at like speaks to you more in that way than it might if you didn't actually understand what was being said. Um, so I think that's one answer is, you know, understanding what you're saying and why you're saying it and why it's, I think that helps internalize praying from the heart because now you understand where it's coming from and you can connect differently to the different prayers. Um, but on the flip side, you know, I I think when people really need it, they know what they know what to do. And you know, there's a lot of there's a, variations on the same Hasidic story. Um, whole bunch of these versions, but they all boil down to the same story, which is, you know, um, the boy goes to synagogue with his father on Shabbat or on Yom Kippur, whenever. And, you know, he's, he's standing there in the middle of services and all of a sudden he's overwhelmed and takes out his violin or his flute or whatever, you know, instrument he again, depends on the version of the story, um, and starts playing it in the middle of services. And the father is mortified. He's horrified. His son is playing instruments on Shabbat, and he tells him to stop. Like, stop what you're... You can't do that! And the rabbi comes over and says, why'd you tell him to stop? That was the purest blessing that was in the entire synagogue. So, there's a sense of, you know, when you're when your heart's in it, it's going to come. But you need to have the tools to be able to have your heart be in it. You need to have the experience of what it means of like of trying to pray before you do it. Um, and I've I've given the example before of, uh, and it's appropriate because it's baseball season that. You know, Rabbi Elliot Dorf compares prayer to baseball. Says, you know, in in all of baseball, nobody has hit 400 in, in throughout an entire season. Or maybe there was one. Was there one maybe who has done it? But you know, Hall of Fame players are hitting you know 350, 300. Um, the average baseball player hits maybe around 250. That means approximately 75% of the time when they go up to bat, they're out. They fail. If the goal of baseball is to get a hit, 75% of the time, the average hitter doesn't do it. They fail. It's kind of the same way. If the goal of prayer is to have this kind of deep, powerful spiritual experience, you're probably not going to get it every time. You're probably not going to hit bat a thousand. And if you're batting 400, you're doing really amazingly well. Like if you're having this deep, powerful experience 40% of the time, and like you're like feeling like God is speaking to you, then you're doing incredibly well. Like most of us, 250 is about right. Like once in a while, you know, once in a while you'll have this powerful moment where you're like, that's what it that's that was what I needed. You'll get this deep spiritual experience that lasts us until the next time we're able to have it. But you're not going to have this deep, powerful experience every single time. Yes, Jonathan. 
Well, I've been thinking about this and, you know, the, the prayers, uh, the ones that we pay, play, that we do in shul. Um, and I, forgive me if I'm not too articulate on this because it's, it's kind of escapes my, my ability to, to, to say it, but it seems like to me that in, in the prayers themselves are embedded uh, spiritual energies um, that, that are very old, they go way back. And, and for me, I trust those things and I may not be completely into the prayers, but I pray the prayers, I say the words and hopefully my heart and mind will follow. Um, but I think even at some subconscious register, some physical register, um, you know, spiritual energy is being, um, produced exchange i don't really know how to how to say it but I, I i sense that sometimes every now and then you know not all the time but sometimes no look I, there's a variant there's a variant on the hasidic story in which the kid goes to synagogue with his father and starts reciting the aleph bet instead of saying the prayers and just start saying the aleph bet over and over again. and his father looks at him and goes what are you doing open the seat order and pray he's like i am praying He's like, no, you're not. You're just reciting the Aleph Bet. He goes, yeah, but if God, but God knows what's in my heart, and God can arrange the letters the way God needs to. Um, so I mean, there's something to that in the Hasidic sense, also you know, <clears throat> saying the words, and God will interpret the words according to what's in your heart, whether or not you know God will, uh, God will understand what you're trying to say through what you're through the words that you're saying. And even when there are no words, I mean, just melody. Uh, that's you know, that's the Hasidic ideal. Is that, yeah, right. You know, the Hasidic ideal is that um, the highest level of prayer is words. It's it's in it's in song and dance, in which there are no words that can possibly express what you're trying to say. It doesn't relate. Right? You're breaking up a little bit, Ellen. It's, it's a little hard to hear you. Picked up a book. Don't even try. The man is like Solomon. He didn't go in the I'm getting a little closer because I'm not getting many words. My computer. Plays. There, I'm good. Like you're, you're good right there. But... Is that good? Yeah. Okay. I picked this book up and I began just scanning it, reading it, and let's see if find what. Do it a little closer again because uh, I think you backed up a little bit. Well, I did, but I also dropped my book. Um, ah, here. There was one poem, and the poetry is absolutely beautiful, but it's very medieval. Yes. Founding to me. But one poem is entitled, Three Things Conspire. Three things conspire together in my eyes to bring the remembrance of the ever before me, and I possess them as faithful witnesses. Thy heavens for whose sake I call, I recall thy name. The earth I live on that browseth my thought with its expanse, which recalleth the expander of my pedestal, and the musing of my heart, which when I look within the depths of myself, bless the Lord, O my soul. Forever and ever. It's it's simple. It's it's clear. It 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 speaks to me of other things that happened in the tenth and eleventh century, in its simplicity. But it's it's beautiful and so meaningful. It raises questions about how many prayers one might make in um, observing the heavens or and in thoughts 
about how fortunate I am to be where I am, when I am, and and then this this vision of of what is in the heart. You have to reach deep down into these musings to find the depth of yourself. I I, I think says says a great deal that could be discussed and explained in far more complex notions. But it may, in me, personally, the question it arouses is, is there some perhaps connection between those who are given to acute hearing or acute seeing that give many more examples of what one should be thankful for. There are enough beautiful things in one small garden this time of year to encapsulate a great deal of gratitude. You would not be short of subjects. I don't know Solomon, but I'm very curious now. I have a tendency to, to buy books that families discard, take the ones nobody else wants. And living in Washington, there was a house sale and a sale of its in, uh, what do you call it? Um, a fair-like presentation of what they owned that none of descendants wanted, which has given me everything from Hiawatha in, in Hebrew as a workbook for a young child in Russia or Czechoslovakia somewhere. But that, that is the region, reason I happen to have these selected religious poems. And as, as I read, as I read the beginning of Leviticus for today, this, this, this longing to connect and the longing to express oneself in prayer just reminded me of the little bit I've read in this book I have inherited. Yeah, and I think, look, I think, who said it at the beginning of like, can I really get through this? Can I really get through reading Leviticus because it's so dry and dull? Um, but I think that's that's a good way to look at Leviticus is, yes, it's a little dry and dull for us because we're not doing it in the same way. But what are they ultimately trying to do? They're ultimately trying to seek connection with the divine and so we have a different way to do that and um this helps us give us a you know we we, we acknowledge how our ancestors tried to do the same thing that we're trying to do mm -hmm. um I, I was reminded as you were talking also of um a singer I follow recently like reposted like a video, an interview with Ethan Hawke, the actor. You guys know Ethan Hawke? Good actor. Big in the 90s, making a little bit of a comeback today. Anyway, um, he, he does a lot of movies and stuff. And um, in one of his interviews, he said, you know, people think art is a luxury. Like it's just something that oh, it's just kind of out there. And, you know, I, I I don't really, you don't really need it. It's not really that important. He's like, until you fall in love or until you get your heart broken. And then art is a necessity. Like you need art to express those things that you don't know how to express otherwise. And, you know, whether it's movies or painting or poetry or music, like it, it speaks to you in a way that you didn't know 
like you couldn't say on your own, but you're like, yes, that's how I'm feeling. Um, Gabi rolled, you know, Solomon Ben Gabi rolled does a good job. He he was quite the player. Um, Huda Halevi does is also a wonderful player. Um, Jewish poet wrote, and both of them wrote a, a lot of liturgical poems. Um, so, um, and in some sense, you could make the same case for prayer and liturgy generally. That you know, it feels like I don't need it, I don't need it, but in the moment you need it, it's suddenly a necessity, and it speaks to you and tell speaks to you in a way that you didn't know you needed at that moment. Any uh, closing thoughts, comments? Uh, I have a question, a, a vocabulary question, because I've been okay. studying this Parsha. I'm, I had the honor of chanting the fifth uh, Aliyah. And in that, uh, in that, let's see, I think it's Leviticus 7.30. It refers to, I'll just, this is, I think this is Chabad's um, uh, translation, but his own hand shall bring the offerings of the Lord of the Lord made by fire. The fat with the breast shall be he bring, that the breast may be waved for a wave offering before our Lord. Now maybe you all talked about this. I was a little bit late, but what the heck is a wave offering? I'm not, I don't think I've ever. I can't remember encountering that. Oh, said 30. Yeah. And it may be just their their particular no, translation. That's... I don't know. No, um, so there were offerings, <clears throat> certain offerings in the temple that you would bring and give to the priest, and the priest would kind of elevate it. Yeah. And, that's know, kind of what I thought before, it was. Before putting it on the fire, there was things mm -hmm. like he would elevate it up and um yeah, I know, but my sick mind had me seeing the guy waving a chicken breast for everybody. You know, I don't, I don't know. The word just kind of. <laughs> no, that's only at Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> okay. Um, no, it's, but yes, like there's a, um, he kind of elevates the uh, Arachumash translated as an elevation offering because he kind of he will hold it up. Okay. Instead of just throwing it put on, he elevates it and then puts it on the fire. So it's really an elevation of an offering, not necessarily a wave, but a yeah. I mean, there maybe he has to like, yeah. depending how you he might have to like wave okay. up, down, left, right, forward, back, and then put it on. So it's kind of like a wave. Yeah. But um, yeah, my mind just immediately went to a, a football stadium with people doing the wave. I don't know why I touched that. Yes, before you bring before you put the sacrifice on the altar. All the Kohanim need to do the wave before uh, he shines over. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes, Barbara. Um, mine is also kind of a of a word question. The um, the fire has to stay on all the time. The fire where the sacrifices are burning. Is that where we get the near tamid? No, I, there's somewhere. I think there's somewhere else in Lishkan uh -huh. where it talks about that there should be a lit fire at all times, but not on the altar. That's elsewhere. I'd have to look up the exact verse. I don't remember the exact verse offhand. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question, um, and it's, uh, I mean, I'm ignorant, um, and so what you said earlier um, about um, the timing of, uh, uh, about Shakrit and Ma'ariv, you know, the prayers and so on, that's something that I didn't know about, um, and um, I'm wondering, um, how you learn about that stuff. 
you read you read uh commentaries you read talmud you read these things there is i mean rabbi Sachs bases it um off um there's a long midrash in the talmud in the brachot um that basically you know tries to figure out why the timing is when it is in there and that that's kind of the conversation is you know it, you know this rabbi I, I don't remember which one's which i think i think rabbi yochanan if i remember correctly thinks it's based off the sacrifices mm -hmm. which poses a problem which the talmud brings up there's no mari sacrifice there's no evening sacrifice so how do we have Mari? And his his response is essentially, well, you know, the mincha sacrifice would burn all throughout the night. So there's there's Mari. Not entirely satisfactory, but fine. Um, I believe Reish Lakish argues that it, the timing is based off the patriarchs, as I explained before. Um, problem with that. This doesn't explain Musaf sacrifice. Musaf sacrifice is not no explanation whatsoever for that. Um, and so that's where I think uh, you know Rabbi Sachs comes in and says that what we're what prayer is trying to do is synthesize both of them. That the rabbis try to synthesize both points of view and merge them into one, so that you have the ritual and you have the ritual and the heart. You have the script and the spontaneity. You have the timing and you have um, the sacrifices and that we're trying to kind of merge both. Um, but in terms of, you know, how do you find out about these things? You read a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you read... Uh, you read commentaries on, you know, I think that's in a Rabbi Sachs's commentary to to a Cedar. Um And I, I just remember it because I like it. Um, you know, you read Talmud and there's a lot of stuff in the Talmud about, especially in Brachot, about prayer. Um, that's it. Um, but, you know, that's kind of, you know, you read enough on these kinds of things, you pick it up. So I have to become a rabbi to know all that stuff. <laughs> uh, you know, that's that's one of the beautiful things about Judaism is outside of Kabbalah, because um, nothing is really the domain of um, domain of other people. Like anybody can study, anybody can be. Anybody, like, there's no secrets. Um, anybody can come to the Beit Midrash and learn. Anybody can come to the lectures and learn. It's not like the rabbis are hold the keys to secret knowledge and nobody else can get. It's all out there. It's just, as Kohelet says, there's no end to books. So, I mean, there's no end to the commentaries that we write. And, you know, you could read... 24 hours a day, seven days a week for your entire life and not get through all of the commentaries and all of the books and everything that's out there. Like, you just can't. There's it, there's so much of it. Um, but if you ever want recommendations, I can give you recommendations. <laughs> Anything else before we wrap up? Well, thank you all very much. Uh, pleasure thank to you. work with y'all as always. Uh, Kola Kavod. Uh, next week, we get the eighth Parsha. Not really, we're well past eight, but it's Parshat Shmini, which means the eighth. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll learn Parshat Shmini next week um, and go from there. So Kola Kavod. Have a good week, everybody. And if I don't see you before then, Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much.